adulterers. God will judge. Father, we thank you for your word. Again, we thank you for your provision. And Lord, a conversation or Old King James Sundays in 1997. You have always provided. And you've always done it the same way, touching the hearts of people who are being hurt, fed from the word of God and want to give back to you. Thank you, Lord, for this place, uh, this wonderful facility you've given to us that we are using all over the week, Lord. All this. Thank you, Lord, for the ministry going on in this place to tell people about the love of God, the forgiveness of God and the mercy of God. But Lord, also warning us of the judgment of God. Thank you that you have provided so many things. Be with us now in Hebrews 13 as we wrap up this book. I pray that you would also change our love and our understanding of who you are and your great love for us. We bless your name and we thank you for this day in Jesus' name. Amen. By the way, just so you get a sense of our heart, growth for us as you have. How many leadership is not how many people are coming. It's more people getting saved. That's growth to the body of Christ. And so we praise God when we find that there are Bible studies going on, people doing outreaches, flower show outreaches, ministries, you know, different things, where more people are hearing about the love of God. For us, that's real growth. That's where we're coming from. Love to see God people, God's people multiply and increase. So chapter 13, we studied this part last week. Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers. And yes, some are more strange than others. For thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember them that are in bonds. Again, we heard from the underground church is bound with them. And them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. Marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers, pornos and adulterers, God will judge. Let your conversation, or old King James, for manner of living be without covetousness. And be content with such things as you have. How many had that verse run through their head this last week? Seeing something on the TV or hearing something on the radio, like, wait a minute, we just, yeah, I got to be content with such things. Two of you. Or hearing something on the radio, like, wait, if you weren't content to listen. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Wait, say that again. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Hold on to that. You'll need it in two verses. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. Amen. And I will not fear what man shall do unto me. And so, verse 7, remember them which have rule over you. Who are they? Who have spoken unto you the word of God. Church leadership. Remember them. I've spoken to you the word of God. Whose faith follow. That's pretty simple. Remember them who have rule over you. He's going to talk about, make sure you're not a grief to them. Notice, what should those who have rule over God's people give to them? What should they say to them? Verse 7. Two of you. The word of God. I have a question. Why are so many churches turning from giving people simply the word of God? Why are they turning to six-week series on this, five-week series on that, six-week series on how to have a series? Why don't they just give people the Word of God? I, you know, personally, I think it's hard work. I, I marvel at some of these guys out there. Like, wow, how did he think of all that? My, my sermon is the text. If I lose my place, I go back to the text. I got my outline right here. It's, it's here. This is easy. Off the record, this is easier. <laughs> but I don't understand why they're leaving from it. What could be better than to hear of the love of God for you and God's faithfulness and his promises? If you weren't content to listen for him. And when you go through the word, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, you'll talk about relationships. You'll talk about giving. You'll talk about God's faithfulness. You'll talk about God's healing. You'll talk about these things as you work through the scripture. Those that have rule over you who have spoken unto you the word of God. And by the way, when someone comes and wants to talk to me about something, I always try to imagine behind them, what does the word of God say? Never mind my opinion. Joe Foch said one time to me when we were dealing with a problem, Sin is messy. Boy, he's right. And sometimes you listen to people and they're like, and they leave you nor forsake you. And Uncle Tommy did that. And, and you're like, oh, uh, you're trying to diagram it out. Oh, uh, uh, X equals this is messy. You know what? Hey, never mind all that. This is what the word of God says. And you just, what does God say? 
Give them the word of God. Whose faith follow. How many of the people listening to the reading of this letter to the Hebrews were able to open their Thomas Nelson study Bible and follow along? How many? Zero. How many of them had their own copy of the text, a parchment? Answer, most likely close to zero. So what is the only chance they have to get the word of God? When it is presented there in their churches. And that's why Romans 10 talks about faith comes by hearing, because most would never have a chance to read. And hearing by the word of God. And so in this case, remember them that have rule over you. Their job is they should speak unto you the word of God. And by the way, their faith leave thee nor of following. And so if you're in leadership, you should be setting an example for others to follow. Paul, when he wrote to Timothy there in 1 Timothy chapter 3, talking about the requirements for a deacon or for an elder, brings up this exact point. He says, look, if a man can't rule his own house with his kids and his home in order, then if he can't rule at home, how's he ever going to help oversee a church? Their faith has to be worthy of following in their house, and then God can use them outside of their house. And so whose faith follow should be worthy of an example. Do you realize that some of the people at work that watch you every day and they know you're a Christian and they love to rub it in your face. You're Take the, hold on to that. Christians, a joke you can't hear might hurt you. But when somebody's in trouble, who do they come to for prayer? The little Christian. Is our faith worth following? Do they see something different in us? Do they get on the phone with their wife and go, I told you not about me. And then you're over there going, oh, praise God, love you, see you when I get home. God bless. Okay. Do they see a difference in the phone calls with your spouse? They see a difference? So that we, is our faith worth following? How we live? Considering the end of their conversation. They're, again, their manner of living. Remember them which have rule over you, who have spoken to you the word of God whose faith you should be able to follow and consider, think about how they live, their manner of living. They should be a good example. And that is an admonishment to us who are in leadership or who desire to be in leadership. If you want to be stretched as an elder, Paul writing to Timothy, or as a deacon, it's a good thing, but make sure that you're an example worthy of following. Does that mean you'll get everything right? Lord is my helper. Amen. But it means you shouldn't be walking in open rebellion either. Jesus Christ, verse 8, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And all the church said, Amen. Amen. What is that? It's a verse. Thank you. What does that mean? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. What is the word for that? It starts with M and ends in ability. It says immutability. Oh, theological terms. Oh, hang on. It's not so bad. Immutability is a big word that means unchangeableness, ness, 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 ness. Why do I say it that way? So you remember. Immutable, unchanging. And by the way, that's an attribute of God. Well, how do I know that? Turn two pages into James. James 1.17. Which is our next book, by the way. Which means we're going to study trials. Which means, guess what's coming for you this week? And for me. Every good gift and every perfect gift, verse 17, is from above. And cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. God is immutable. He does not change. The author to the Hebrews lets us know Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, which means he is ascribing to Jesus the idea of the attribute of immutability, which is a prerogative of God alone. Now for Old Testament, Malachi 3, just before Matthew left turn, Malachi 3. The unchangeableness of God. Don't you wish that was the trumpet? <laughs> How many hear it? It's a fire alarm. Don't you wish? They <laughs> Malachi 3, 5, And I will come near to you to judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against the false swearers and then against those that oppress the hireling and his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right, and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. Verse 6, for I am the Lord, what does it say? 
I change not. That's immutable unto you the word of God. For you sons of Jacob, you are not consumed. God made a covenant with them because he changes not. The covenant is sure. Psalm 89. Psalm 89. Left turn. We'll be in verse 33. Nevertheless, my loving kindness, why not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail? My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. Verse 35. Once I have sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. His seed shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever as the moon, and as a faithful witness in heaven, unchanging. Psalm 90, verse 2. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are eternal, you are unchanging. That is the idea of immutability. So back to our text. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Did he heal during his earthly ministry? Yes. Can he still heal today? Yes. Don't forget that. Paul the Apostle, did he have a healing ministry? Oh, some of you aren't sure about that. Acts chapter 18 there, when he goes to whose faith, it says that God began to do unusual miracles through the hands of Paul. Like the usual miracles weren't good enough. So God decides to do unusual miracles. And so people are being healed. All kinds of things are happening. And then when Paul writes to us in 2 Timothy, there at the end of the book, he said, yet Trophimus have I met left in my leadum sick. So Paul has had a healing ministry where even sweat bands and, and hollow. And people were delivered from sickness and demons. And yet when he gets to Miletus there, Trophimus is sick. And obviously they prayed for him. And yet he remained ill. And so they had to leave him at Miletum. So even someone like Paul who had a healing ministry, that healing ministry is still under the sovereignty and the will of God. And so, yes, we ask the Lord for healing. Yes, we seek the Lord that he would touch and heal people. But it must also be submitted to what God desires to do. And I'll tell you truthfully, I wish we saw God heal more people. We see healings from time to time. We see them. We see God answer prayer in a major way. And just about often enough to encourage us to keep going. But he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we can ask him for healing when we need it. And it is according to his will. His sovereign will. We could get into a long discussion about, well, what about their faith? Tell me, how much faith was Lazarus, was Lazarus exercising as he lay dead in the tomb? <laughs> Why did Jesus say, Lazarus, come forth? Because if he said, dead man, come forth, the whole tomb would have emptied. It would have taken a while. Remember, they bury his families. He had to call Lazarus out by name. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines or teachings. Because Jesus hasn't changed at every time Easter comes around, the Resurrection Sunday. Some magazine is doing some new expose on the historical Jesus, which tells you that he's changed. It doesn't line up with Hebrews. He's the same. Yesterday over you, he's going to talk about new assault as character. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, and they are out there. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats or foods, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. You know what? Focus on the Lord. Focus on grace. Don't get into all kinds of dietary stuff. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat, which serve at the tabernacle. All right, verse 10, let's consider it. What do you do on an altar? Sean's got it. Sacrifice. It's the brazen altar in the Old Testament system. That's where they brought the sacrifice. Yes? yes. Cut the throat, poured out the blood, put the sacrifice on the altar. There it was consumed in the fire. Everybody with me? Yes. So what is our altar? Where was our sacrifice made? On the cross. We have an altar, cross of Christ. What happened there? The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. By his stripes were healed. Through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, sin has been paid for. As he said, it is finished, literally paid in full. Those who have rule over God. Now, when we take communion, 
We take the bread, we remember the broken body of the Lord. When we take the cup, we remember the shed blood of the Lord. These things were completed or achieved for us on Calvary. We have an altar, the cross of Christ. We sang about it, bringing us to our knees. We have an altar. They have no right to eat, which serve at the tabernacle. They're in the Old Testament system. We've come out to receive Christ by faith. For the bodies of those beasts, rams, bulls, goats, whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin, what should they say to them? Without the camp. Remember Yom Kippur? The priest goes in first with blood for his own sin, and then he goes in with blood for sin of the people. And so they would sacrifice the bullock. They would pour out the blood. He would anoint there the altar and the golden altar and the other things. And then they would take the carcass and they would drag it outside of the camp. And verse 7. So the sin offering has its blood shed in the worship of the place of God, temple there. But yet it is also dragged out and consumed, or the tabernacle, outside the camp. Even so, Jesus. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Oh, they scourged him in Fortress Antonia next to the temple. And his blood began to be shed there. And as he would bear the cross and carry it out till they imposed on Simon the Cyrenian, here his blood would be also coming along with him. Their opinions? We think the Damascus gate crossed a little bit what is now a street and basically a part of a block. And then it would end up at a place called Golgotha, which is translated in the Latin Calvary place of the skull. And there they crucified him between two thieves. And there he gave up the ghost and there he died outside of the city. And so blood being shed like the sin offering, he went forth outside the camp and he suffered without the gate. He is our perfect sin offering. Let us therefore go forth unto him without the camp. The word of God bearing his reproach without the camp of even Judaism to lay hold of Christ. Now it's interesting if you were here with us Wednesday night with Ido, Ido is a believer in Christ. And when you talk to him, he'll tell you that he is now what he considers a completed Jew and that he's a Jew. He's a son of Abraham by blood but he's also become a son of Abraham by faith and that he's believed God and by believing God through his son, it's been accounted to him for righteousness. And so when you remember Jesus resurrected there, there are so many churches turning. Things must needs be fulfilled that were written of the Christ that he first should suffer and then enter into his glory that were written in the law, the Psalms and the prophets. And so for someone like Edo, who has believed on Jesus as his, Messiah, as his Savior, his Messiah, he has become a completed Jew and that the law, the prophets, and the Psalms have brought him to the feet of Christ. And so having received Christ, he's not only a Jew by blood, but he's a completed Jew by faith. And so let us go without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city. <laughs> Word of God, Jerusalem, destroyed. Some feel the letter could be written as late as early 68 before the Jewish uprising, which two years later would cause Titus Vespasian to come and destroy the city. That verse has got more behind it than they knew. Here we have no continuing city, but we seek one, a city to come. What city is that? The heavenly Jerusalem we talked about last week. For here... Again, no continuing city, but we seek one to come by him, by Jesus. Therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. God desires and delights in the praises of his people. But to do good and to communicate, the word is koinonia, to fellowship, sharing, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Doing a Bible series on that six-week series. It's the biddies. Going through the word with the biddies last night. We have the girls, the boys, the biddies, and the two little guys we call the bucks. So the biddies. And explaining to him about how not a bone of him shall be broken. We're talking about the crucifixion. We're in John's gospel. Breaking of the legs of the two thieves. How his legs were not broken because he's our Passover lamb. But he's also our sin offering. 
explaining to him how he'd be lanced through the side to fulfill Zechariah 12.10. They will look upon me whom they have pierced, thrust through. We have a better sacrifice. Christ has laid down his life for us in fulfillment of the scriptures. Does he ask us to do some crazy, you know, a religious pilgrimage to be saved? Does he ask us to solve, you know, quadratic equations or trigonometry, trigonometry or anything else to be saved? What does he ask? That we believe on these things. That God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. Paying for our sins. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise unto God continually, fruit of our lips and giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to share koinonia, forget not, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. I, you know, person that have rule over you within the church and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they thus must give an account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable to you. Obey them that have rule over you. Where should you draw the line? If they ask you to do something contrary to Scripture, should you obey them? No way. In fact, find a new church. How many have heard of the doctrine of shepherding? Really? How many have not heard of the doctrine of shepherding? I marvel at some of these guys. Okay, so some have never heard of it and only two have heard of it. How many are actually still awake and paying attention? <laughs> Even less. That's what I thought. There's a doctrine of shepherding that is, is still going on even today within the church. And it sounds something like this. I'm not sure if I can get out there. Like, wow, how did he think of all Until I talked to pastor so-and-so. I'm not sure I should change jobs or buy a new house or buy a new car until I go talk to pastor so-and-so. You might be thinking, oh, you got to be kidding me. No, this is really out there. It'll be clothed or couched in terms like I need to get advice from pastor so-and-so. And I've encountered this. I've seen it firsthand. And it's, it's within all kinds of different churches, not just a certain denomination or movement. It is essentially where the leadership have so invested or so, in, you know, smothered their church that they, they really kind of put a trip on people that you need to come talk to us before you make any major decision because we're the ones who will give you the right kind of guidance and all that. And, and unfortunately, at its most extreme level, it really is an abuse of God's people. And it's out there. It really exists. To where people are, in a sense, you know, unable to make any major decisions for themselves. Here's the problem with it. It is robbing God's people of the opportunity to seek the Lord for themselves and hear from the Holy Spirit what he wants for them. Instead, it's putting their eyes on men. And men, I got my outline right here, it's, it's a fail. Men crash and burn. And so it's a great disservice. It's actually much like legalism. Legalism is putting a bunch of rules and traditions on God's people instead of letting God's people read the word for themselves and let the Holy Spirit define for them what is a liberty for them and what is not. Because if you're truly listening to the Holy Spirit, he is never going to say it's okay for you to walk in the flesh. He's always going to say, you're in the flesh, you need to come back and walk in the spirit. And so whether shepherding or legalism both have similar manners of operation in that they are essentially putting God's people in a box Instead of letting God minister to them, they're having men or man-made rules define with the record. This is evil. It's a dangerous place to be. It shows up in some extreme abuses where people get genuinely hurt. And so that's why I tell you week after week, don't take my word for it. Go read the word of God for yourselves. Go study for yourselves because the word of God is the final authority. But as he writes to these people and says, look, obey them that have rule over you. Yes, that is a good and honorable thing to do unless it is abused. And then hopefully common sense and the Holy Spirit will make it known to you that you need to say something or grab your family and run. Get out of there. For they have watched for your souls. And in case they forget, but I don't understand. We will be judged as shepherds. We will give an account. James is going to talk about it to us again. Be not many masters. Receive a greater judgment. That they may do it with joy and not with grief. I'm glad that's there. Be sheep of joy. Damn why they're leaving from it. 
Not cheap of grief. Meh. <laughs> <sighs> For that is unprofitable to you. I think it's the third time through now here in Hebrews on Sunday mornings. Two times ago when I was teaching this, I was dealing with an individual, or we, the leadership, were dealing with an individual who was very difficult. We were calling the person on some things that weren't right. They didn't take too kindly to that, so their decision was to go ahead and assassinate our character. They did that to fellow churches, fellow ministries, write letters, all kinds of things. What could be better than to hear eventually that individual went to jail for some of the very things we tried to call them on? It's never fun when you're doing what God tells you to do and you're sticking with the word of God and people decide they don't like it, they have a bug under their bonnet, and so they're going to assassinate the messenger instead of listening to the message. But it happens. And if you sense God stirring you to be involved in ministry in some fashion, let me tell you something. Spurgeon, I think, once said, a pastor should have the heart of a child, the brain of a scholar, and the skin of a rhinoceros. Because, face it, God's people sometimes, the sheep have teeth and they have horns and they use them. But it can be trouble. God's faithfulness and his promises. Remember them. Obey them. They have rule over you. Submit to them. What if you don't like what you're hearing? Well, then confront them. If they don't agree and you have clear biblical understanding, then go to another church. They're supposed to watch for your souls, that they must give an account, and that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable to you. And brethren, pray for us. For we trust, we have a good conscience in all things. Hold it. Don't just blow by that. First three words of verse, eight, verse 18 are what? Pray for, us. Pray for us. We need it. Do you know 2011 had some sad upsets within churches in our area? Some failures in leadership? Congregations that are still wounded? And we don't stand. Take heed, he who thinks he stands, lest he falls. How you need to be praying for the pastors, for the elders, for the deacons, because we have a roaring lion who loves to take out servants of God to wound God's people. And so if you've never really had a practice of praying for us here as far as leadership in the church, for the elders, for the deacons, for the coordinators of ministry, we ask you to pray for us. Here the author of the Hebrews is saying, pray for us, please pray for us. We ask the same thing, pray for us. Even if it's breakfast, lunch, and dinner, we'll take it. We'll be happy, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Pray for us. But pray for us. Because there is a roaring lion who's an adversary who loves nothing more than to destroy the work that God is doing. Brethren, pray for us. For we trust we have a good conscience in all things, willing to live honestly. But I'm sure you'll talk about relationships. They're to do this. What? Pray for us. That I may be restored to you the sooner. This person appears to be in some form of detention. Now, verse 20, the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Question, what apostle do we know was in prison quite a bit? Paul. Oh, so you're saying Paul wrote Hebrews. No, I'm not. Talk about God's faithfulness. You'll talk. But verse 20 is interesting. The God of peace is an expression that is used six other times in the New Testament and always only by one author. Guess who it is? Paul. So you are saying he wrote it. No. <laughs> I'm saying we've got a phrase here that is only used by Paul and the person writing appears to be in some form of detention. <laughs> Why didn't he just write his name down? Oh, he's got a little credibility problem with some of the Jews in Jerusalem. Read the book of Acts. That would explain it. We'll talk about these things as you work. It brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus. Amen? Amen. Through the great shepherd of the sheep, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, which will not change, make you mature, complete to set a bone, put it back in place, or to outfit a ship for a voyage. Make you complete in every good work. Why? To do his will. Working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. 
Amen. And I beseech you, I beg you, brethren, suffer or allow the word of exhortation. For I have written a letter unto you in few words. Who does that remind you of? Paul. Well, 13 chapters and how many verses? Few words. Know that our brother Timothy is set at liberty. Hmm. Timothy seems to have been in prison with this individual. Who was known to associate quite a bit with Timothy? Paul. <laughs> now, if I say he wrote it, for eternity future, if I'm wrong, you'll all be messing with me in heaven. Hey, Mr. Hebrews is written by Paul. How are you today? <sighs> Rule over you. Know that our brother Timothy is set at liberty with whom, if he comes shortly, I will see you. Salute all them that have the rule over you, the leadership again of the church, and all the saints, and they of Italy who have spoken unto you. What area was Paul detained in for the last two years before 68 AD? Rome. Where did Paul stand, step from this world into eternity? What town? Rome. Grace be with you all. Amen. My hope is that having understood Hebrews, you are in a better position to talk to someone who is a Jew and is that not completed. By the way, when someone comes, vices, pointed to the ultimate sacrifice, the Lord Jesus, that these Psalms, the Lord said, sit on my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Psalm 110, point to him. And that he is the fulfillment of all the things that are written in the Old Testament. He is the bearer of the better covenant. He is King Messiah. My hope is that you have a greater love for him because of this book and perhaps a greater boldness to share with those who are Jews that the Messiah has come. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, as we move into James and the gloves are going to come off, he just calls it what it is. I pray that James would refine us as believers so that we truly would have a faith that is worth following and that we would be living epistles. Lord, we have no idea how long we have until you come. We know that day or the hour will be like a thief in the night. But we have a dying world around us. That is the word of God say. No matter what they try. Today they're going to worship the tube with the Super Bowl. Half of them are going to be disappointed. <laughs> the other half on Monday have to go back to reality. Only Jesus satisfies. Thank you for these things, Lord. Go with us today in Jesus' name.